this was the first quantitative measure of the mental processes of the driver. How much attention do you have to pay on this particular task or this particular job? Virtually everyone doing research in automobile driving would be aware of and sensitive to the findings of my experiment. Their work isn't all desk work, as shown by this experiment on the attention span needed for safe driving. The experimenter is psychologist John Sanders. I'm John Sanders, um, a scientist in a number of fields, and I teach, and I'm a consultant, and uh, I write things and read things. It's possible to have fun being an academic, and I always had fun. Almost everything was not in the conventional way. I was um, really quite fortunate in that people seemed remarkably willing to uh, overlook or didn't in fact realize that they were overlooking um, the usual kinds of uh, data and descriptions that they extracted from people. I was born in 1920 uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 153 Lexington Avenue, about a mile from Harvard Square. And I was the youngest child in a family with five children. The four older were girls. The youngest was three years older than I. And they were all very intelligent, wonderful students, except sometimes they had difficulty with their arithmetic. I used to help my youngest sister, who was uh, three years ahead of me, and she, in payment for that, defended me against all the kids who wanted to beat me up. I entered high school at age 12. The algebra teacher was a great friend, and he wanted my parents to put me into a school that would accelerate my mathematical education. But they, he didn't tell them why he thought that would be a good idea, so nobody ever did anything about it. Graduating from high school was surprising and disappointing in many ways. I got a call to go up and present myself at the headmaster's office. And he said, John, I could give you a fully paid four-year scholarship at MIT. But John, I'm not going to do that because you haven't done as well as you should have done well, given your talent in this school. That's all, John. So I turned and went back to my classroom wondering why he had bothered to call me in the first place. I never knew. For this difficult student, somebody has suggested Antioch as a college that knows how to deal with unusual students. Antioch cheerfully accepted me and I went out to Ohio on the train to become a student. And Antioch uh, and I, they didn't really get along very well and they eventually sent me home uh, with a letter addressed to my father in those uh, sexist days. Uh, dear Mr. Sanders, it's very rare that Antioch asks anyone to leave before the end of his first year, but in the case of your son, we're making an exception. And my father read this and he said, people will always make exceptions for you. 
And in fact, that has been the, the story of my professional career. After this conversation with my father, and I said, well, what do I do now? And he said, well, you have to get a job. And I said, well, how do you get a job? He said, well, never speak to anyone who is not empowered to make decisions. And that has proved to be a, a very useful guide. What happened is what I consider almost a series of accidents. I kept finding myself in interesting situations in, with corporations and doing interesting things. And that usually means something that nobody else has done. And it ends up with uh, other people uh, being willing to, uh, to offer me uh, positions for which I have none of the standard requirements. The whole thing began with uh, the being thrown out of Antioch. A, a young student whom I had met there, he learned that I had no particular job and wasn't doing anything. And he said, well, GE is hiring people. Why don't you apply? GE was, must have been short on people or something. So they hired me on the, to work on the night shift from 11 p.m. till 7 in the morning testing aircraft generators. And then after a few months of that, uh, I was promoted to daytime work and given the task of testing generators in the daytime and teaching new hires how to test generators. Somewhat later, I took a position as head of the psychology department of the U.S. Air Force Medical Research Establishment uh, in Alaska and stayed there for exactly one year and a day, which seems like a strange time, but uh, I had decided to leave because I felt that the laboratory wasn't doing anything important. And I had to make sure that I had been an employee long enough so that they'd pay my way back and not charge me for bringing me there. So I stayed a year and a day. When I left the uh, Air Force appointment in Alaska, I had almost at the same moment received an invitation from Minneapolis Honeywell Corporation uh, asking me to set up a research group or department in Minneapolis, and I had accepted that. Uh, the division that I set up, devoted to engineering and psychology, we received the uh, task of designing the cockpit for the first American spaceship. What the posture should be, what constraints needed to be placed, um, what the controls would be so that the change from very heavy acceleration to zero acceleration, zero G, wouldn't result in inadvertent, uh, inappropriate control. And what the displays were going to be, because we didn't know what was going to happen to the pilot when, when the pilot's at zero G for a significant amount of time. There weren't any degrees in spaceship design, you see. My qualifications for that uh, were that I seem to have more brains than uh, was necessary to do the job. The relationship between human beings and the machines 
that they operate. And it can be a, a pilot with a spaceship or a driver with an automobile. These, to me, are the same problem with a few changes in the stuff. Driving along the section of Route 128, and I'm trying to get an estimate of the demand driver by this particular section of road. The speed of the car is constant, and as the road varies from moment to moment, in the demand that it makes upon me, I must look more often or less often, as the case may be. The driver doesn't do what the driver wants to do. The driver has to do what the road demands the driver do. And the task of the driver is to pay attention to the road. And I coined the phrase, attentional demand. The system and the outside world mandate that the driver has to look and distribute the attention across a wide range of sources of information. Driving in 1955 in a rainstorm in Ohio and finding that there was a speed, I think about 32 miles per hour, I could drive at comfortably. If I went 33 miles per hour, I felt uncomfortable. When 10 years later, I was asked, how do you measure ordinary driving? I converted that into a methodology by saying you provide the driver with the opportunity to look as often as he or she wants to at the road. And this then tells you what the demand has been on the driver. So the number of looks that the driver made any particular time period was a direct measure of the demand of the road. The records that we get of the time between looks at the road give us a direct measure. The switch was mounted on the steering wheel under a thumb, so I could just press it and I'd get a half second look at the road and then I'd have it shut off again. So whenever I needed to look, I looked. That's called the attentional demand. And I was just doing what was demanded. One day I was in my office at uh, PBN and uh, a man called who had been sent over by BBC to do a documentary on Technology Highway. That's Route 128, which is the circumferential highway around Boston. He was told by somebody that there was some interesting, uh, unusual experiments being done by this bunch over in Cambridge. So he came to see me. I had him strapped into the back seat with the aircraft type uh, safety harness. The cameraman crouched under the dashboard on the right side of the car and I drove over to Route 128, threaded my way into the usually 60 to 70 mile an hour traffic and said, okay, let's go. And dropped the helmet over my face and then whenever I needed to look, I hit the switch for a half second and simultaneously gave a brief technical description of why this bizarre collection of activities was going on. The visor completely occludes my view during the period that it's down, and I must rely on some stored image or memory of what the road was before the visor went down. So what happened as a result of this was that it was picked up by the International Standards Organization 
I think about 10 or 12 years after I published. And I discovered just recently is also written into the Canadian Book of Standards for Automobile Driving. Nobody ever asked me about it. They just took it and did it. And I'm delighted that they have a use, but I wish they had let me know that they were doing it. I received the Ig Nobel Award because my research, which the BBC thing shows driving down Route 128 uh, with an opaque visor dropping over my face like this as I drive, seemed crazy enough to uh, win an Ig Nobel Award. So I was invited, and it's a fun thing, and I accept it with pleasure. So I won this Ig Nobel Award, which is the periodic table on a table. So it's the table table. The consequent of this is that I look back on what my father had said, that people will always make exceptions for you, and by God, he was correct. One of the major questions about error is, do people commit errors or do errors happen to people? The science and ignorance of human error. And just to give you an idea of the importance of this, um, people in the United States every year, uh, the death rate in hospitals do largely to error is about 100,000 people a year. And we are proportionately at about 30,000 in Canada. The era suddenly became interesting because people demonstrated to me the uh, era, which I really hadn't realized, was very common in the use of medication and something needed to be done about it. Anne and I uh, decided that what we needed was to call a lot of scientists in uh, to talk about it. And we'd have a conference in the village where we lived in Maine at that time. This is the ERA conference. And this particular conference was the first one dedicated to the question of the nature and source of human error. Nobody had ever engaged in a large-scale investigation. I do think that Anne's and my setting this thing up, funding a good part of it, and making sure that it happened had a fundamental influence on medical safety and on safety in general, because the science of human error was, in a sense, born then. This became the object of interest. So it was a terribly important thing to do. What it did was to open up a new area of research which actually pays off in saved lives.